to the Gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded by the Apostle Luke, chapter 1, very first chapter of the book of Luke. You're going to say, Brother Marl, it's not Christmas time. Well, this isn't a Christmas message. But I think it's an important message because there's so much misunderstanding on this subject matter in the church world today, and the enemy has perpetrated doctrines and ideologies upon the church that are false, and today we want to dispel the darkness, amen, and let the light shine. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26, we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Isn't that the second time we've read the word favor? And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. I want to talk to us this morning as quickly as I can, probably going to take every bit of my 45 minutes, the true face of favor. The true face of favor. Master, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this morning. Tonight, God, as I would strive to bring this message forth, I ask God that your anointing and your presence and your power would rest upon it. God, let not one word fall to the ground, but let it find its place in the ear and in the hearing and in the heart of each and every hearer. God, that we might be set free and liberated today by a knowledge and truth of exactly what favor genuinely, truly is. Master, in Jesus' name, let your anointing flow like precious oil this morning, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I'm going to go straight into it. Favor. What does favor mean? As the angel came to Mary that day and said, Thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. What does it mean to be favored by God? Favor means literally when God is pleased with us. Hallelujah. Mary was engaged to a carpenter, not a king. She was working class mother, not ruling class. She served others and was not served by others. Many today would say she lived in abject poverty. Some might even go so far as to say that she lived at a time in history when women were viewed as property and their value was only calculated based upon the man to whom they were attached. So many preachers this morning want to get into the pulpits and on the television sets of our nation proclaiming that wealth and prosperity, big cars and expensive homes are signs of God's divine favor. Some have gone so far as to declare that university degrees and layer upon layer of higher education are signs of divine favor. By these standards, our Lord Jesus Christ was abandoned by God while he was yet in the manger. You hear me now? Everybody, we always point to the Lord on the cross feeling that he was abandoned. I always stress that. It's not about what really had happened, but it was about what he was feeling. Oftentimes what we say isn't about what really happened, it's about what we're feeling. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, that baby should have been saying that in the manger. If the standard 
favorite of so many preachers today is true. That being, if you're favorite of God, you're well to do. If you're favorite of God, you're rich beyond measure. If you're favorite of God, you'll drive a great car. If you're favorite of God, you'll live in a nice house. If you're favorite of God, you'll wear the best clothes. If you're favorite of God, you'll have the best education. If that be the truth, then obviously Jesus was not favored. Here he was, not even born in a home, but in a stable. My Lord, have mercy. He was born into a working class family. Talking about Jesus. He never attained one lick of formal education. Now, Paul received what was the equivalent to a doctorate degree in his time in theology. Jesus didn't get any education in the church. At 12 years old, he went into the synagogue to teach, not to be taught. <laughs> he didn't receive any formal education, nor did he aspire to any level of success in the material, business, or economic worlds. Jesus, he didn't own a business. He didn't own a home. But you know what he did do? He did walk on water when he needed to get to the other side. Hallelujah. And a boat was not available to ferry him. He did feed more than 5,000 when only enough food existed to feed one little boy. He might have had to have borrowed a donkey to use as transportation as he and his disciples were about to enter Jerusalem that day to celebrate the Passover where they rented a room in which to celebrate what we call the Last Supper. But you better believe he was still highly favored of God. Might not have owned a lot, Mother. Boy, this don't agree with a lot of your prosperity preaching you hear out in the world today. Let me tell you, we're going to set that junk in order. Isaiah 53, 1 through 3 tells us of the Messiah. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He doesn't sound very favored, does he? If you're going to judge favor by externals, friend, it doesn't sound like the Lord was very favored. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 20, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So are you willing to pay that kind of price? I don't even rent a place to live. I stay with friends. I live wherever somebody opens their home to me. Oh, Mother, by today's prosperity standard, Jesus was abandoned by uh, God Almighty in the very manger. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethpage in Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye have entered in, you'll find a colt tied whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him. And straightway he will send him hither. The Lord didn't even own his own donkey. He had to borrow one. Didn't even have his own transportation. How do you like that? We feel bad sometimes because our transportation is junk. The Lord didn't even have transportation. Most of the time he walked if he had to go somewhere. And when it came time to ride into Jerusalem that day, why did he have to get a donkey? Why couldn't he have walked into Jerusalem? I'll tell you why. Because there was an Old Testament prophecy that said, Behold, your God is coming, riding upon the foal of an ass. 
So he got the donkey and borrowed the donkey in order to fulfill a prophecy. Luke chapter 22, verses 20, uh, excuse me, 7 through 12. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? Where do you expect us to do this? <laughs> you don't have a house. Where do you expect us to do this? You want a big old group of 13 men to celebrate the Passover? Where Peter's house is too small. John doesn't have a big enough place. Lord, where are we going to do this? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city. Isn't it interesting? People wonder, he can't be God. He can't be anything but God. Every step of the way, he always knew exactly where everything was. You wonder sometimes, oh, hallelujah. You wonder sometimes if God knows where you're at. Honey, if he could know there was going to be a donkey sitting there waiting for him, if he could know that there's going to be a man doing this, then you tell him, I need a room. The master's going to have a uh, need of space. He always knew where everything was, just like chess. He knew where every piece was. When he needed something, he knew exactly where to go get it. He said, well, what you do is you go down here, and you're going to bump into a man who's going to be carrying a this, and he'll be doing that, and you talk to him, and you tell him this, and this is what he'll tell you back. Oh, no, he wasn't God. He was just a, he was just a, a you know, psychic friend. Listen, he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water said, you're going to bump into a guy who's carrying water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. When you see a man with a pitcher of water go into a house, follow him. Go into the same house he goes into. And ye shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber? Where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. Phew, God, if that don't give you chills down your spine, nothing will. Everything was in place. Oh, but this man wasn't favored, Ma. He didn't own a home of his own. He wasn't favored of God because he didn't drive a Cadillac donkey. He wasn't favored of God because he didn't have uh, spinning wheel covers on his, you know, on his little horsey poo. He wasn't favored of God, no. He didn't have wheels that cost more than the bloody cart did. He wasn't favored of God because he didn't have wealth and he didn't have uh, prosperity as we would judge it by uh, contemporary standards. But favor does not always manifest itself in a manner that is visible to the human eye. A carnal man will often look upon the favored as though we were cursed and depraved. But the spiritual man looks upon the favored and understands that God is blessing that individual so far beyond measure by guiding his or her life in the direction that it ought to go, sparing them so much pain, so much grief, so much woe, so much heartache, and so much failure. They may be poor, but they're highly favored because God is guiding their bark. He spared them all kinds. It's like that little man says when, when uh, Shirley Caesar does her little routine about the shouting John, you know. Now, you might have looked at that old black man and thought, well, he's poor. He has a little farm. Yeah, he's got a little farm. No big deal. But he, he don't have a lot of money. He don't have a lot of this. He's not very favored. Why, this preacher on television the other, black preacher on television the other day, had the gall to stand there and brag about his degrees and which universities he had attended and where he'd been and what he'd done and how that this was an indication of God's favor. That's what he said. He said, this is God's favor, people. Let me show you what it is to be favored. I think old Shouting John, and Shouting John knew favor isn't measured by how much money you got in the bank. Favor doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you own your own business or not. It doesn't matter whether or not you've got a fancy car. Favor, Shouting John said, you know what? I'm an old man, and I've got a whole stack of children, 
And not one time in my life have I ever had to go down to the courthouse because one of my children was put in jail. Not one time have I had to bury a single one of my children. I'm an old man. I've watched my friends and my neighbors bury their children, and I've never had to do that. Oh, let me tell you what the true face of favor is. Hallelujah. We think in order to be favored of God, we've got to have. But God's favor manifests itself differently, Mother, than just in our possessions, in what we own and what we have. Oftentimes, I want you to know today, favor will appear today as failure. Amen. Amen. Some man struggling, trying to get to a meeting. I'll never forget a heard a story about like this years ago. Preacher was trying to get to this meeting, trying to get to this meeting. It was so important that he get there. I believe he was a missionary. It seemed like everything that could happen happened to hold him up, so that he couldn't get to that meeting. Well, sometimes. Favor appears as failure. We're not getting done what we think we're supposed to be getting done. We're not getting where we think we're supposed to be getting. But what happens as he's driving down the road, suddenly the tire blows out on his car. And he gets up and says, God, this is the last straw. I just can't take it anymore. I failed. I just, I'm just not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I can't, do you know, you ever feel that way? You feel like, God, I've done everything I do? He's sitting there trying to change the tire on his vehicle. He's running late for that meeting. All of a sudden, a vehicle drives up the street, and the men tell him, when were you supposed to be going over that bridge down yonder? The man said, well, if my bloody tire hadn't blown, I'd have been on it about maybe five, six minutes ago. And they said, well, it's a good thing you weren't. The bridge is washed out. The entire thing collapsed. Every car that was on it was washed down the river. It's presumed that everybody's dead. So was he really a savior? Or was he really God's favored? <laughs> you see, sometimes God's favor, what appears as failure now, is actually God's favor because he is preventing you from tragedy. He's preventing you from pain. He's preventing you from heartache. My Lord, have mercy. But tomorrow that failure will blossom as a rose. Look at the story of Joseph. In the word of God, Joseph, in his coat of many colors, appeared to be favored by his natural father, Jacob. But it was only after a long and difficult journey fraught with pain and horror, deceit and betrayal, that Joseph finally was able to see that what he had only seen in his dreams, God had been favoring him all along his journey. God had been favoring him, Tommy. The poor kid was turned on by his brothers and sold into slavery. God had favored him. He lived half his life in prison. He lived half his life uh, serving somebody as a slave. God had favored him. Yes, God had favored him. God had been favoring him all along. Uh, when the greatest hour of distress would come against his family and his kinsmen, he would by then have been elevated to a place of favor where he would become the savior of his entire nation. All because when God was favoring him earlier in the story, it didn't look like favor, but it was. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? A lot of people look at Brother Mora preaching tonight, and he doesn't have a church with 8,000 people, and he doesn't have a mega church, and everybody thinks that's a sign that he is not favored by God. Oh, guess again. Guess again. If God's got to prevent me from having a mega church, if I could easily go out there and have a mega church and God's working against me to prevent it from happening so that in the end of this race my soul will be saved, then so be it. I trust God's judgment. 
Look at the man David, David the king, David the psalmist. David served in the court of the king, appearing to be favored above all others by Saul, the sitting sovereign. But when David's virtue and integrity were put to the test by the abuse and jealousy of Saul, David found that his favor came from a higher source. When his life should have been wasted, the divine favor of Jehovah God kept him secure in the shelter of his arms. And when he might have seized the throne of Israel, promised to him by God Almighty, David had the opportunity at times to seize the throne. He could have just taken it. It was already promised to him. Saul was within arm's reach. He had a dagger in his hand. He could have killed Saul and taken the throne. But listen to this. When he might have seized the throne promised to him by God Almighty, by bringing Saul's bitter and angry life to an untimely end, J David chose the high road. And, ex and exhibited his loyalty to and his love for Saul, the aging king. When David was, excuse me, was David not favored while he sat for years playing the harp in Saul's court? While Saul received the accolades for battles won with David at the head of Saul's armies, was he not favored when everybody else was getting the credit for his work? Some people would tell you that's so. If you ain't getting credit for the work you do, then you're not favored by God. Because if you had God's favor, you'd be getting credit for the work you do. My Lord, have mercy. We may think today that our doing the work and another receiving the praise is evidence of lack of favor. But in truth, listen to me now, only a man highly favored is able to wait his turn and give room for his glory in due season. David would eventually eclipse Saul so that history records David as the greatest king ever to rule over Israel, Saul is barely a footnote in Hebrew history, even though he was the first king. So see, by David taking the high road and waiting his turn, he established a reputation for integrity. He established a reputation for loyalty. He established a reputation that spoke so highly of him, Tommy, that when the history books would be written, they would sing his praises from one end of the earth to the other. How do you like that? Oh, but he wasn't favored of God, because if he was favored, you know, he'd have gotten credit all the way through. I think not. Listen to me now. Uh, would David have aspired to the same level of glory and reputation that he enjoyed had he murdered Saul to seize the throne? No. Because then you'd always know him as David, the man who murdered Saul to get the throne. Amen. Am I telling the truth today? I'm talking today about the true faith of favor. Job. Job was favored when he was rich. Of that there is little doubt. He had all kinds of children, all kinds of homes, all kinds of farmlands and farm animals. Oh, how God had prospered him. But how many of us fail to recognize that Job was every bit as much favored when Satan took from him every last thing of personal value that he had. He was favored in his hardest times every bit as much as he was favored in his prosperous times because favor means when God is pleased with us. Hallelujah. And what you have and what's going on around you is not an indication of whether God is pleased with you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. The truth is today, <laughs> when the God of all creation declared, you can take everything he has and bring everything you want to against his soul, but you cannot 
take his life. God's favor was at work. As long as there, woo, hallelujah, as long as there is life, there is hope. <laughs> Recovery and restoration can come after everything is lost, Mother, so long as we live to see it come once again. Job didn't lose God's favor in the trial of his life. In fact, he was experiencing the highest level of favor known to any human being. When God is able to look into the eyes of Lucifer and say, Have you considered my servant? Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's the highest level of favor. God was so pleased with Job. He had so much confidence in Job. He was able to brag about him to the devil. Lord have mercy. Oh, but we got preachers in the world today trying to tell you that Favors when you got stuff. Favors when you're loaded. Favors when you're rich. When God's favor is shining upon you, you're going to have, you're going to own, you're going to possess, you're going to do baloney. The true face of favor this morning. Many of those who are most favored by God will never realize the full import of that favor until they stand in God's presence on the opposite shore of eternity. <sighs> My Lord, have mercy. How many will look, be allowed to look back upon their lives to see that the Lord spared them an eternity lost by withholding from them great financial blessing or secular work success? How many people are going to look back and all their lives they envied Elvis Presley? Well, he got out there one day, made a record. Somebody happened to overhear it. They went and talked to him and put it on the, on the radio. Next thing you know, everybody wanted to hear it. And before too long, Elvis was a multi-billionaire. And he had Cadillacs that were pink and purple and blue and yellow. And I just don't know why. I want to have me a mansion like Elvis had. And blah, blah. But you know what? It nearly cost Elvis his soul to have all that. How do you know if God lets you have it all? If it wouldn't cost you yours. And when you stand before God one day, you may look back and the Lord will say, Donna, here's why I didn't let you have all that. Not because it didn't love you, but because it did. Not because you weren't under my favor, but because you were. I didn't let you have it because I knew it would have ruined you. I knew, you know, sometimes we think we know, just like a child. You know, you tell a child, the child says, I want candy, I want candy. No, it'll ruin your appetite. No, I want candy, I want candy. No, it's going to ruin your appetite. It's not going to ruin my appetite. Oh, no, sir, it won't ruin my appetite. You let the kid have the candy. What happens when dinner time comes? I'm not hungry. Now, you told the kid all along that candy would ruin his appetite. Well, we do the same thing with God a lot of times. We stand there trying to tell God, you know, Lord, it won't ruin me. It won't hurt me. Oh, Lord, no, if you give me a million dollars, well, I'll just be the bestest Christian you ever seen. I'll just be, you know, because we think we know. And God's sitting there. He says, no, believe me, I know better. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. Amen. Listen to what Paul writes to Timothy about this notion that uh, prosperity and blessing come in the form of all these financial things and all these earthly possessions. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we, carry, we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the truth, uh, from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith. Keep your faith intact. 
Worry about what's important, not what's not important. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many wit witnesses. The desire for wealth and riches may seem like a noble desire, but that desire, according to Scripture, is the snare of men's souls. It is a trap and a prison from which we cannot escape once we have followed after its elusive bait. Some within the church have even gone so far as to suggest that monetary blessing is a sign of a better, stronger, healthier spiritual life. Oh yeah, Benny Hinn, you know, he walks with God because he's a multimillionaire. Well, listen to what Paul said in the same exact chapter of Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, verses 1 through 5, the five verses preceding what I just read to you. He said, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing. This is what Paul has to say about these prosperity preachers. This is what Paul has to say of those who preach uh, the kind of doctrine and perversion and dis disgusting uh, abuse of Scripture that we see in the church today. He said he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Now listen to this next statement. Men of corrupt minds who are destitute of the truth, the very comma, supposing that gain is godliness. From such... Withdraw thyself. Our church would be full this morning if people really knew what the Bible said. But most of them are running to the church where the preacher got all the money because they think he's going to be their financial uh, guru. He's going to be their ticket to success. How many people are going to T.D. Jakes this morning? Because T.D. Jakes comes across and wants to make you believe that he has all that he has because he has God's divine favor. And if you'll attach yourself to his ministry, you'll have the same kind of favor that he's got. But favor is not measured in what you own. Favor is not measured in how much you can spend or how much you can charge. Favor is not measured today in what kind of car you drive. The true face of favor is very different. The Word of God tells us in Proverbs 20 and verse 1, wine is a mocker and, and drink, strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Ephesians 5 verses 15 through 18, so then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, Redeeming the time because the days are evil, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Say, brother, why would you read that? You just read two scriptures have to do with alcohol and wine. I'm trying to make a point about favor. The child of an alcoholic may see their years of youth as trying, difficult times filled with tears and many sorrows. But that furnace of testing forged them into the strong, resilient, alcohol-avoiding success they are today. I watched Donald Trump on Larry King, I believe it was the other day. Don Donald Trump has never drunk an alcoholic beverage in his life. He says, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't use drugs. And uh, Larry King asked him, Wasn't, isn't the reason you don't drink because of your brother? He said, yes. 
my brother was an alcoholic. I saw what it did to him, and my brother constantly begged me and pleaded with me, Donald, whatever you do, don't ever so much as pick up one drink. Not even one. Don't even sip it. Don't let it touch your lips. Avoid it like the plague. <laughs> you may think, child of God, that God's favor was not manifesting itself in your life when you grew up in that circumstance. But you know what? That circumstance, that's why I thank God for everything I've been through, because, honey, I can say today I've been through it. I'm not going to live there. I'm not going to stay there. I've been through it. It's in the past. I'm in the present. Let's move on. Hallelujah. But God's favor was in your life then, because that is what's helped you to become who you are now. You could have been born to Mr. and Mrs. Sweetness and had a perfect family life and had all kinds of wonderful things and you wouldn't have the compassion today for people that you have. You might have been born to Mr. and Mrs. Sweetness and you wouldn't have the level of love and uh, an open heart for people the way that you do today because the circumstances and the trials of your youth that forged you into the person that you are today were God's favor in your life. He didn't abandon you by any stretch, any more than he abandoned Jesus in the manger. No, he was there for a reason. I'm trying to finish real quickly. The Word of God says in the parable of the uh, unprofitable servant, the Bible tells us that the Master gave to every man according to his ability to receive. If you look in Matthew chapter 19, verses 7 through 12. God doesn't give us more than we can handle. And if he isn't giving it to us at that moment in time, he knows we can't handle it. I have to remind myself that all the time. Say, but, but, Lord, why don't you send this many people? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? You know what? I don't question God. I've learned to realize I must not be ready. And if I'm not ready, then I don't want it. Because if I did it when I'm not ready, Tommy, I'll just mess it up. If God gives it to me before I'm able to handle it, Mother, I'll just tear it up. I'll ruin it. The Word of the Lord says in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Trying to close up now. How often in this life do we see riches and wealth bestowed upon one who is entirely incapable of managing or maintaining it? Many, if not most, of those who win the lottery will fly through their winnings on mindless spending sprees, amassing stacks upon stacks of debts, so that in the end they are far more in the hole than they were when they had little or nothing. Thank God our Heavenly Father knows to only give us what we are capable of handling. That is the true face of favor. When we suppose to know God's plan sufficiently so as to be able to accuse Him of not favoring us because of our current circumstance, we are frankly arrogant and out of place. Child of God, stand up today in every situation and circumstance, rich or poor, old or young, perceived by men a success or perceived by men a failure, and declare today before the angels of heaven, I am a blood-bought, spirit-filled child of the Most High God. I have the power of Jesus' name within me and the authority of his person behind me. No matter what my neighbor may see, no matter what the church member beside me this morning may see, oh, hallelujah, I am highly favored, hallelujah, because God this morning is pleased with me. Our Lord walked upon this earth without ever having, excuse me, owned a business or owned a home or even held title to his own camel or donkey. By many standards, he was a pauper and a vagabond. 
And yet he took 12 men from various walks of life and forged them into a force that would introduce a new religion to the world that would sweep over the face of this planet and that religion endures to this moment in time right now. Was he favored? Oh, you better believe he was. I dare say he was just depends upon which standard you're using to make that judgment call. And lastly tonight, Matthew 3, 13 through 17, the baptism of Jesus at the Jordan. And you remember the Bible tells us, and I'll read it, as uh, after the Lord was baptized, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, a voice from heaven saying, notice it doesn't say, and God said from heaven. Every single gospel words it the same way. There was a voice from heaven. It doesn't say there was another person up there talking. It said there was a voice from heaven. I'll preach one of these days when God plays the ventriloquist and throws his voice. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased favor. At the baptism of Jesus, oh, this is a wonderful way to wrap this message up. I hope I can get the last few seconds in on this tape. At the baptism of Jesus, the Lord was just beginning His public earthly ministry. And yet, the Spirit of God voiced pleasure or favor already in the man Jesus Christ. Before he'd done any big miracles, before he'd done fed any 5,000, before he'd walked on the water, before he'd done any of these things, the Spirit of the Lord was speaking and saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Because why? Because he was on track and well on his way to fulfilling all that God had designed for him. If we can just stay on track this morning, and not necessarily have already done, but be in a track of obedience and submission that can only lead to spiritual maturity and perfection, then God, our Heavenly Father, can say of us, you are my beloved son or daughter, and I am so very pleased this morning with you. You have my favor. Amen. Would you stand with me today? Amen. Did you get something out of that? There's so much false teaching, folks, in the church. It's been out there now for about 25, 30 years, this prosperity garbage. I know a little lady at the Riverside Church of God. Bless her heart. She kind of reminds me of Don and Troy a little bit, but I, I wouldn't say she's quite as bad, but there's a similarity in a sense. Little Sister Alexander, bless her heart, precious little saint of God, precious, faithful little lady. Comes to church every time the doors open, pays her tithes, uh, loves the pastor, supports. I've never heard her say a negative word about anybody, anywhere, anytime. And you're not going to tell me that while some might look at that little lady like she's poor, some might look at her like she hadn't got a whole lot. She's not in a place in this life where she's able to receive a lot. She's not of a mind to be able to manage a lot. But do you know what? She's happy where she is. Amen. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If you can be content, Paul said, whatsoever state I'm in, I've learned to be content therein. And if we can be happy where God's got us, then, friend, you own a lot. You've got a lot. Master, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this message. Lord, there may be today those listening by tape, those, God, that will be hearing this message on the Internet. We pray, God, today that you would help to push from their spirit this erroneous notion 
that your favor is manifested in prosperity and wealth and possessions lands and houses and jewels and money but Lord rather your pleasure is expressed when we walk in your perfect and divine will we do what you ask us to do we make every preparation Lord so that tomorrow we can continue to do what you've asked us to do it pleases me this morning God to know in my heart that every time we come to this place, and whether there be few or whether there be many, we're in the right track. We're doing what you want us to do. And that means that whether this looks like a big deal to others or not, we are in your place of favor. Master, in the name of Jesus, 